So, good morning, everybody. Uh, those who I haven't introduced myself to, I'm obviously Tom Lovejoy, uh, your uh, speaker for the morning. And I made a last minute decision here not to immerse you in 40 minutes of PowerPoint. Uh, that's a little heavy at breakfast. So, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the subject of how biology and nature relates to climate change. Uh, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way than I normally do uh, in a formal PowerPoint. And I'm going to crib a little bit from something I gave as a dinner speech uh, last Thursday evening. So um, I decided to start that talk in a place where people would not expect me again, uh, and that was in August of 1962, uh, when I was out in the western desert of Egypt uh, as an undergraduate taking a year off. Just prior to going down to Egyptian Nubia, where the UNESCO and other people were trying to figure out how to cut up the big temple of Abu Simbel and move it away from what would be the rising waters of the High Dam and Aswan. So uh, my job on that expedition was to do biological collecting in case there were biological remains found with prehistoric artifacts. <clears throat> and our partner organization in Egypt was the U.S. Navy Medical Research Unit number three. A uh, really interesting network of epidemiological research centers the Navy supported around the world. Uh, and so just to get me sort of warmed up, I got added to a, a trip up to the Western Desert to collect mammals, uh, which in a desert like the Sahara, you only do at night. Uh, because that's the only time mammals come out. And uh, before we could actually go collecting, we actually had to go find uh, our Bedouin gods because they really knew the desert. And so we, we found their camp and we then went through an age-old ceremony and a rug was sort of laid out on the bare ground uh, and we were drinking tea together before we went on the night's hunt. And if you've ever been out in a desert at night, uh, you will know that the stars are extraordinarily bright and visible because there's no moisture in the air. Uh, and it almost, it almost creates sort of a pale blue light. And I certainly remember thinking at that moment that not surprising that three of the world's great religions started in a place like this, because it just <coughs> sort of makes you think and think about you know stirring souls and the rest. Anyway, so we're, we're doing all of this, and that's going through my head. And I look up, and one of the very first satellites went overhead. So the juxtaposition of modernity with the ancient ritual was quite stark. And it was a moment when I realized that what E.E. E. Cummings, the poet, called the world of the born, namely living things, uh, and the world of the made, the man-made, uh, were rushing apart. And of course that has continued and accelerated uh, ever since uh, 1962. Uh, and some of that has obviously been for good, uh, for benefit of people, benefit 
for the environment, and some of it has not been so good. Uh, and uh, that leads me to also touch on something that uh, I flagged for all my students about two or three weeks ago, uh, namely the death at 105 of uh, an amazing scientist named Ruth Patrick, who was a great pioneer in water pollution, uh, but who in 1945 uh, published a study uh, which is just fundamental to environmental science and to environmental management. And she was funded by the Sun Oil Company, wanted to understand their impact on streams and rivers in the east of the United States. And in 1945, she published this incredibly important paper uh, in which she demonstrated that the numbers and kinds of species we find in those streams and rivers not only reflects uh, the natural condition, the physics, the chemistry, uh, the geology, uh, and ultimately the nature, but it also reflects all the stresses that are being put on the watershed. And so in the end, that sort of divergence from the natural level of biodiversity becomes the best way to measure human impact. And I like to call it the Patrick Principle. Uh, and it is at, at the base of all environmental science and management. It just nobody ever stops to think that somebody had to prove that. Uh, so she did that. Um, and I don't think she ever quite realized how incredibly important that contribution was. But she did get the National Medal of Science in 1993 from Bill Clinton. Uh, and so if you think about the biological diversity of the planet today, and you think of it in terms of the Patrick Principle, uh, and we have these soaring extinction rates and endangerment rates and all kinds of stuff that uh, I could depress your morning with. Uh, it's, it's clear that we are having a truly serious impact on the fundamental nature of the living planet. <coughs> and that was summarized quite nicely in 2009 in a diagram called Planetary Boundaries. Just Google it. it sort of looks like a spider web. Uh, and at the center are all these different aspects of the environment. And then radiating out from that uh, in red are three sets of data about the environment where the planetary boundaries have been exceeded. And one of them involves the nitrogen cycle uh, and the way that there's now double uh, the natural amount of biologically active nitrogen in the world, and that gets reflected in things like dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, another, the second of the three in this diagram that uh, has transgressed the boundary and is in red is climate change, and it's, it's actually it's underestimated uh, because the impact of climate change on biodiversity is a lot bigger than that diagram would suggest. And then the third is biological diversity. And it is by far the biggest violation of a planetary boundary. And that's simply because any of those other planetary boundaries which are transgressed, uh, any environmental problem, in fact, is only an environmental problem because it affects living systems. So biological diversity integrates all of those. And you would expect it to be the greatest trans transgression. Uh, so with that as background, I want to talk just a little about climate change and make the point at the beginning that the science of climate change is actually quite old and 
quite distinguished. It goes back to 1896 when the Swedish scientist Arrhenius uh, asked the question of why is the planet a habitable temperature for human beings and other forms of life? Why isn't it too cold? And the answer in 1896 was carbon dioxide and the greenhouse effect. He understood that carbon dioxide, uh, not alone, but uh, in a very major way, uh, actually traps radiant heat and makes the planet a warmer temperature than it otherwise would be. And he actually, interestingly enough, he calculated with pencil and paper what doubling pre-industrial levels of CO2 might do to planetary temperature. And it's really not too far off from what the big fancy supercomputer models uh, project uh, today. In any case, uh, the science is old. Uh, anywhere you look on the face of the planet today, you can see the impact of climate change uh, on living things. Annual cycles being changed species beginning to change their ge geographical distributions. Uh, you know, the Joshua trees are departing from Joshua Tree National Park as they track their required conditions. Uh, but I wanted to actually, instead of taking into all the details of, of those, in a sense, are minor ripples in the fabric of life, is actually look at the bigger picture and why it is so important, and what nature can actually do to help us address some, but not all of the challenge. So uh, the general agreed upon <coughs> target among nations is to stop uh, climate change at about two degrees uh, Celsius over normal pre-industrial level. And we're currently at about 0.8 to 0.9. Uh, we have some great people here at Mason, uh, Professor Shukla, who's studying a lot of all of that. Uh, but when you really scratch at that two degrees, what you discover is the real reason it was picked is because the negotiators thought it actually might be achievable. It wasn't because it might have been particularly a good place to stop uh, in terms of the environment and human well-being. Uh, and when you begin to look at it a bit further, uh, in terms of sea level rise, you go back, uh, the last time the planet was two degrees warmer, the oceans were four to six meters higher. So in a sense, I mean, what more do you need to know that two degrees is not a really great idea? Uh, even though at the moment you don't hear very much about that in Congress or the Parliament or wherever you may be. Uh, but you know fully well if anybody had ever gone to the floor of the U.S. Congress and suggested raising sea level, uh, that elected official probably would have ended up in St. Elizabeth's. Uh, so anyway, sea level rise is an important issue, but also it turns out that the biology of the planet is very sensitive to that. It will not be good for ecosystems. Uh, the two degree world uh, is not a world which will have tropical coral reefs. Uh, the coniferous forests are in Western North America are now devastated by native bark beetles um, because the summer is longer, they get one more generation, the winters are milder and more over winter. And in fact, there is a story on page three, I think, of the post today, looking at the whole North American forest question. And it's a little more complicated than I just presented. Uh, and inevitably, all of these things become more complicated the more you look at them. But just the ability to tip the balance between a native bark beetle uh, and the trees which make up the forest uh, at 0.8 degrees 
tells you that two degrees, even though you can't predict what all the elements are, is not a smart place to go. So the, the issue, of course, uh, is that we're still emitting uh, to a fairly well. Uh, and if we wanted to even stop at two degrees, emissions have to peak in like 2016, 17, 18, something like that, uh, which doesn't sound very realistic. Uh, although there, there is more good stuff going on on the energy side uh, than you might be aware. Uh, I had lunch with somebody yesterday who's figured out, uh, he's probably the smartest person on the built environment about energy and climate change. Uh, and he was telling me about a new form of concrete which has a much higher reflectance than normal concrete and that means less heat accumulating in cities uh, and the like. I mean it's like five times more reflective than normal concrete. So a lot of that stuff is going on all the time and we don't know about it. Uh, but nonetheless, we have this two degree issue. And so what might actually be done to avoid going to two degrees? Uh, what might be done about the issue that at two degrees it's roughly 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere compared to the 280 pre-industrial. And the Royal Society has said, if you want to have tropical coral reefs, you've got to stay below 350. So it's an all over. Uh, the oceans are acidifying uh, because some of the CO2 they uh, absorb every year, some of it turns into carbonic acid. So the oceans are a tenth of their pH unit, more acid than in pre-industrial times. And that sounds sort of trivial until we remember that actually it's, it's a logarithmic scale. So in absolute terms, it's like 30% more acid. And you can already find damage uh, at the base of food chains in the North Atlantic off Alaska, uh, oyster beds, and in the Northwest uh, and the rest. So are we sunk? Uh, well, no, we aren't sunk. Uh, because uh, a significant portion of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere uh, actually comes from centuries, principally the last few centuries, of destruction of ecosystems, deforestation, mistreating grasslands, agricultural systems that leak carbon. And there's absolutely no reason uh, that about 50 parts per million, maybe a bit more, could be pulled back out of the atmosphere long before it has trapped enough radiant heat that it gets us to two degrees. Uh, and uh, I've been working away at this as my students know for a long time, and it's, it's just beginning to get some traction. Uh, and so if you think about it, it's, it's uh, major reforestation, uh, better management of forests. Uh, Brazil is actually seriously considering some major reforestation efforts, uh, and they're considering it for two reasons. One, this issue of, of what it would contribute uh, as a partial solution to the climate change challenge, but also because it'll protect the integrity of the hydrological cycle of the Amazon, which basically uh, makes half of its own rainfall. Uh, and it's pretty close to what might be a tipping point to cause Amazon dieback in the south and the east. Anyway, Brazil is embracing this. Uh, and so there's a lot that can be done with forests. There's also a tremendous amount that can be done uh, by restoring degraded grasslands and grazing lands. Uh, 
And I can't give you the number off the top of my head, but there's a huge amount of degraded grazing land and grassland in the world. Uh, and if you restore it, you not only get this carbon removal benefit, uh, you also get better grazing, right? So it's, it's some of these things are win-wins. Uh, and another important segment of this restoration will have to be uh, agricultural ecosystems uh, and designing their management in ways that builds carbon back up in the soil. Uh, we, have, you know, we have just been, particularly in the middle part of our country and up into Canada, the agricultural practices. Uh, once John Deere invented the plow that could break up the sod, uh, where the native grasses had roots down like 10 or 12 feet and of carbon in those soils, the richness of those soils was amazing. Uh, and a lot of it has just leaked out of there uh, with modern agricultural practices. And even though this may sound sort of like very dreamy, I mean, how are we going to get farmers not to plow? Well, in August, I was out in Peoria, Illinois, uh, and I was in a taxi driven by a third generation farmer. Uh, and he and everybody he knows in that vicinity are practicing no-till agriculture. I mean, they've come to it on their own. And maybe one of the lessons was that there's so much topsoil in the Illinois River that it actually paid to dredge it out and sell it back to farmers to put on their land. Uh, so, so it's forests, it's grasslands, it's agricultural systems. And as we're learning uh, much more recently, uh, there is another window of potential here in what's called blue carbon. And that's mostly about coastal ecosystems, it's mangrove ecosystems, it's wetlands. Uh, and obviously, you know, every peatland in the world should be flooded so that it's not just oxidizing and going up uh, into the atmosphere. So that's what I call a wild solution to climate change. It's not the solution because it's not enough. Uh, and I think there is every reason to put a premium on trying to find non-biological ways to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's tough because the concentrations are low and it's very expensive to do. Uh, pulling it out of chimneys where it's at least 10 to 100 times more concentrated uh, is pretty close to being economic for right now. Uh, so why do I get excited about a wild idea for climate change? Uh, it's because it does a couple additional things. It basically sends the message that our planet actually works as a linked physical and biological system. Uh, and interestingly, twice in the history of life on Earth, there have been just screamingly high CO2 levels because of various geological events and things, and then brought down to pre-industrial levels by biological processes. So the first time that happened was with the arrival of green plants on land, and pulling, using photosynthesis and pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into plant tissue, but also a lot of stuff going on in the soil, because soil formation is also a good way to sequester uh, carbon uh, from the atmosphere. So that's happened twice. We just don't have tens of millions of years to wait, uh, but we have the ability to understand the planet actually does work as a biophysical system uh, and actually do this kind of restoration at scale uh, in a way that will actually be beneficial for 
all the agricultural targets that will have to be met with additional population. Uh, and in the end, it has the capacity, just like Victory Gardens uh, in the Second World War, that almost everybody can make their contribution by planting a tree or doing something that promotes a little bit of nature to recover and pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's what I call my terminal quixotic dream, uh, which is to sort of move the world to recognize this and to begin to actively engage with it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. So what about most? What do you think about George Mason and all the development that's been going on in the last probably 15 years and the wooded areas that have been lost here continue to be lost on the West Campus? What can we do here? So it's a really good question. It would be a really interesting student project to figure out you know, how much CO2 actually buds lost in the process. Um, uh, it would be interesting to figure out whether there are some ways that some of it could be put back into living systems. Um, and then there's the whole energy budget for the university as a whole. Uh, and I just sent the president yesterday uh, an opportunity to buy wind generated electricity uh, at rates which considerably lower than one pays for normal electricity. Uh, so I think there are a lot of great ways that uh, the university can actually think about sustainability at the campus scale. Yes, sir. One uh, such um, effort that uh, I learned about when visiting uh, Michigan State University, I just told John McHugh about it, is um, there uh, a colleague of mine was able to convince the administration to install on campus a power plant uh, fueled by burning waste uh, or, or from, from waste generated methane and uh, considering the amount of money that is spent on cutting away this waste uh, and the amount that would be saved from generating electricity this way. This, this is a real win-win. Um, and I, I suspect it's probably a, a better deal economically than, than wind, which is not really all that good in Northern Virginia, except in isolated places. I, I just wanted to comment on something, uh, what I consider the, uh, the two biggest obstacles to doing something serious on climate change. Uh, the first is um, uh, viewing changes in, let's say, energy generation or um, that we can do to the solution are often perceived as a trade-off between economics and the environment. And so it's really important to concentrate specifically on those uh, areas that make sense economically. Uh, and fortunately, as you mentioned, uh, in connection with one development, the technology is increasingly uh, moving in that direction all the time, making things uh, cheaper. And there's all sorts of things that can be done right now that would be economically viable as well as. Uh, well, good. that's a really, really important point. And uh, one of the things that is lagging. <coughs> And the way we think about all of that is actually the estimation of the costs and the impacts of climate change. Uh, so there's a really interesting new study, a year-long study, uh, that is just starting uh, at McKinsey and Company uh, with a whole bunch of national leaders, but uh, Jeremy Oppenheim at McKinsey uh, and former President Calderon of Mexico who gets climate change in part going to be two key figures on it. Can, can I make my second yeah, point? Sure. I, might, I think the biggest obstacle of all is um, 
misinformation and uh, what I call um, paying attention to irrelevant facts. Um, and um, I mean, when, when the reason that the public attitude, I think, about climate change has moved in, in recent years into a somewhat unfortunate direction with the divide between the political parties in, in this country ever widening is that people pay attention to their own set of facts and use them as, well, of course, if climate change is not happening or whatever. And this really permeates uh, society very widely. I'll give you one recent example. There was an article in Time Magazine plus lots of other media outlets talking about how uh, the percentage of Arctic ice has um, increased during the past year by a very significant amount. I think the figure quoted was uh, 60%. Yeah. Now, that may be a true statement, actually, um, for that one year, but the amount of Arctic ice during the peak month of the year, where it's at a minimum, varies wildly from, from year to year. And so when you actually look at the 10, 20 year trend, yeah. it's clear which way the trend is going, namely less ice each year. But there was this enormous one year fluctuation that is completely meaningless. And none of the articles pointed this out. And so people looking for you know, support for their view that climate change yeah. is not happening, they seize on this fact, but it's an irrelevant fact. And um, I think not only uh, with respect to statistics, do people really need to understand better what the true situation is, but there's lots of other things well, that I, I, to I couldn't agree with you more. And in, in that particular instance, uh, no mention is made of the fact that while the area ex of extent of the ice has varied, right, all of the trend is clearly there, it's also gotten a lot thinner. So the total amount of ice is considerably less. Uh, so this country has this problem far worse than almost anywhere else on the planet. Uh, and it's partly, it's partly because at one point the Republican Party, which had been such a leader in environmental institutions and law, uh, decided that it would be to its political advantage to be anti environment uh, And I'll just leave that there, right? Uh, but it's also because uh, compared to 25 or 30 years ago, when basically the public got their information from three networks of public television, and they all competed with each other for the same stories which meant that you started you know, with the same information base. Uh, and there is it's basically a disinformation industry out there trying to muddy the waters. So, uh, Dee Dee, maybe we can share with everybody uh, an op-ed I had in the Herald Tribune on the 3rd of October, basically about the importance of recognizing what the science is, uh, and quoting my late friend Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the irrelevant facts yeah, that are uh, yeah. the most harmful. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, it tempts me to use a pejorative word for people who do that. Uh, Fill in the blank. <laughs> and, and we'll be happy to do that, Tom. Um, just make sure that I've got everybody's email if you didn't sign in so that we can pass that along. So what, what prompted me to do it was because the new IPCC report was coming out and basically showed that for the last 10 or 15 years that the, the continual increase in global temperature leveled off for a while. What's probably going on there is some uh, effects of ocean currents. Uh, 
so the heat is in the ocean, it's likely to come back at some point. It's, you know, there's no good news in that, I don't think. Um, but it's being seized upon, just like the area of ice in the Arctic. So yes. Um, yeah. Um, I have one announced, probably one uh, question. Uh, question first. What do you think about uh, climate change and the extreme weather and climate and uh, impact of biodiversity? Because uh, currently, climate change it causes a lot of uh, uh, for example, the hurricane, the high density. Uh, category five hurricane movies, also flood, and, uh, uh, fire, and uh, a lot. Uh, so, so the extreme weather events is one of these uh, aspects of climate change that gets a fair amount of debate, uh, and that's because there are all different kinds of extreme weather events. So, the extreme weather events that lead to major fires in the American West. Uh, no question about that. Absolutely no question. It's statistically so robust that it's just, that's, yeah. Uh, some of the other extreme weather events I think are highly probable, if not completely nailed down yet. Uh, but all of those will have impacts on nature. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, it's sort of the lugubrious catalog, right? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the, the basic point here is the more we can limit climate change, the easier it is going to be to manage the consequences of that climate change. The announced is, uh, you might not know, uh, College of Science has launched one new institute called Global Environment Natural Resources. Institute called Jerry. Uh, if you go to jerry.gmu.edu, you can find it. So that's which we focus on global uh, food water security, uh, renewable energy, probably biodiversity too. Actually, Professor Lab, uh, Tom Lovejoy is uh, the chairman of executive uh, advisory board. We do have uh, the international team, we do have uh, the uh, international agency support, for example, WMO and FAO. Uh, we host the first, um, the symposium, the coming October, next October, yeah, October 20 to 24. The title is uh, Global, um, uh, Global International Symposium of uh, Weather, Climate Extreme, uh, Food Security, and Water Security. We talk about food security, not new crazy. We talk about long-term sustainability. Yeah. Uh, we got a uh, uh, multi-international agency support, include the, the WMO, FAO, UNDP, UNCDD, and uh, uh, also the U.S. government. <coughs> uh, the location is here, October 2024. Actually, Tom uh, the uh, right uh, committee. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had a, <clears throat> a question of how you feel about their, uh, the movement of uh, 350.org, where their um, uh, the charge is to reduce emissions to this 350 parts per million from whatever it is, 400 right now. Um, but the movement to uh, encouraging institutions uh, and, and people in general to divest from fossil fuel companies. So, yeah. so, from so first of all, I mean, 350, uh, I think is not the perfect number, but it's a doable <coughs> number, uh, and would be a world in which you would have tropical coral reefs. You know, a significant portion of humanity lives with a couple hundred meters of coral reefs that depend on them. So, uh, it's not just nice nature. It's our interactions. So there is there is a, uh, a major push uh, to get uh, institutions to divest in fossil fuel stocks. Uh, I hear arguments made on both sides of that as to what kind of difference it makes. I, I, 
you know, emotionally, it would seem to make sense, right? Um, I don't really know what that will do, uh, but it's also a great way to make people think. I think, yeah, that's... Uh, and basically, you know, these huge fossil fuel companies, which are, there's annual revenues, you know, are greater than the GMP of a lot of countries, right? Um, would really like to have a soft life path. I don't think many of them are denying it anymore, but they really want a soft life path. And I don't think the world can afford that. Uh, so I, I think actually, you know, the world is better served by a diversity of organizations taking on a subject. There's definitely a place for a 350 dot one. Uh, if I go back to the days when the Republicans actually stood for the environment, and my friend Russell Train was a uh, late friend, uh, was I guess then he's probably the second administrator of EPA when he said that David Brower of the Sierra Club made it look reasonable. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that, right? David Brower immediately said, you know, Russ Train makes me look unreasonable, but, but it is true. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful for organizations that take relatively radical positions because they make something like what I've just been talking about uh, actually sound much more reasonable than if they weren't saying that over there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. And McKibben is a friend of mine. Yes, sir. I was wondering, you know, your comment about uh, some kind of a, a deal or arrangement to get electricity from wind turbines. Um, so I can really probably pull it up online. Nice. Anyway, right. While you're looking, I'll just mention I, I have uh, solar panels and wind turbines at my farm. And I've noticed that uh, the solar panels produce a heck of a lot more electricity because of what Bob was saying a minute ago, that the wind doesn't blow all that much here in Virginia. So I'm wondering where you're going to get your uh, turbine think, power from. I think the university already buys uh, wind energy. It doesn't come from Virginia, though. It comes from, it's you know, mm -hmm. everything's it connected. From? They, they buy a percentage of their electricity comes from renewable sources, which is primarily the way you get that in Virginia is through wind. We, uh, the Virginia Dominion Power buys wind, uh, or electricity generated from wind that comes from the Midwest, basically. Midwest. Yep, that's, that's how they do it. It's not, they don't have wind turbines here. Right. Yeah, so there's not a lot of detail uh, in this email. So this guy has been advising the District of Columbia on a direct wind buy of about 40 megawatts. Um, and it's at seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour on a 20 year term. So that's from some, com some maybe offshore company or mountain company? I don't, I don't actually remember. I got told yeah. yesterday. Do you know if, if those companies, those wind turbine companies, get taxpayer money to operate? Uh, I have no idea. Well, they all can. Everybody can go in companies takes money from government. Yeah. Taxpayer money. I mean, all the, all, the <laughs> right? fossil, all the fossil fuels have a lot of subsidies, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know enough detail to answer that. The university, through the sustainability office, has actually done some studies in solar here, too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of yeah, that's a good question. Um, my husband actually does solar energy. If you want, he could come and talk to you sometime and explain to you how it's happening in Virginia. It's just there's some changes in some new laws and stuff. Right. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> well, I'll ask you. Sure. Um, I, I, I do notice that when you're in a forest, it's nice and cool, you know moist even because of the trees keeping the sun away. 
But I'm wondering which which is the more effective um, remover of CO2 from the atmosphere? Is it forests or is it grassland? I've read both. <laughs> so it's not it's not only a matter of the rate at which they do it; it's how much they hold as a stock right. when in equilibrium and, and forests, I think, wind, wind hands down globally. Uh, but I mean, just, I, I can't give you the numbers for what the carbon must have been in a period of soils, but it must have been a really impressive number. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering if when people are trying to remove CO2, if that's their primary goal. Is it better to uh, make grassland, or is it better to make forests? So, say for the next century of uh, concern. So, uh, let me put it another way: uh, trying to plant forests where grasslands naturally occur is a real uphill battle. Right? Uh, the vegetation type you find in a particular place, the natural vegetation type, is. You know, a function of of the local climate, uh, yeah. and so you have to go with what you what you've got. Oh, I guess I was thinking about in a rebuilding. I see a lot of fields where farmers have long since retired and they're returning to forests. Yeah. Uh, but for a while, there are weeds, grass, basically, until the trees get big enough. And then it becomes well, I mean, it's all part of the progression of succession. Uh, it all goes in the right direction from a carbon point of view. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you look at forest cover in the Northeast United States over the last 100, 150 years, it's really impressive how much more forest there is today uh, than there was in 1850s. Look at George Mason, all these trees are 30, 40, 50 years yeah. old. Yes, but the development that's going on now is it's not going to go back. I mean, when this was agricultural land and then it went back to woods, but now it's being developed and you get these buildings, and mm -hmm. you're not going to get it back. So, and that's happening everywhere. All the agricultural lands in Northern Virginia that are beautiful woods now, that became beautiful, succeeded to beautiful woods, they're slowly but surely getting developed. And there's no mitigation. For any of the ecosystems that are lost. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sure that's true. Um, maybe there is something that can be done on that front. Yes, ma'am. I hesitate to. Look. I have a silly question, but grasslands are silly <laughs> basically for grazing, right? Or yeah. would be for grazing. I read somewhere, I think it was the Christian Science Monitor, that they're now able to create meat from stem cells, so you can have meat without having a cow. I have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> You could grow a stick with a stem cell. <laughs> On the carbon with the soils, under grasslands versus the soils under the forest, the soils under the grasslands have a lot more carbon. I think that's true. The, I mean, the root systems are prodigious. And there's some really interesting things going on trying to create a uh, mixed species perennial uh, agriculture. The land institute had in uh, Kansas. They've actually they've made a lot of progress to the point where they have solved the issue of how you harvest a mixed species assemblage uh, of grains. Uh, and obviously, you got to sort them out because you don't want to mix them all up. Uh, and it's sorted them. It's been very clever. So the way I look at it is there's plenty of room here for uh, invention and human imagination to make a big difference. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for coming.
Just an aside, Caron tweeted about today's event, and there was a retweet of a company that is doing exactly what Posey just brought up. <laughs> That's great. Good. Well, thank you all for coming. And make sure we've got your name and contact information. Also, um, we are posting all of our Share Your Science um, on our website, ultimately, and so we'll attach Tom's article to the repost. Please feel free to, to share what you've learned today with others um, and, and keep watching for other opportunities to see Tom and, and some of the other fabulous people we have here. Thank you, Tom.